Welcome to A Moment of Bach, where we take our favorite moments from the composer's vast musical output, just a minute's worth or even a few seconds, and show you why we think they are remarkable. We are your hosts, Christian and Alex Kiebert. Today's moment is from the organ Passacaglia in C minor. The moment you just heard is from one of my favorite pieces of keyboard music by J.S. Bach. Now here's a guy who was known in his lifetime more as an organist than as a composer. He was a virtuosic organist. He had a really pivotal moment in his life when he traveled over 250 miles by foot both ways uh, north to go see Dietrich Buxtehude and to learn from him. Now, Buxtehude was someone that J.S. Bach learned a lot from, especially how to write for the organ, and we see some of Buxtehude's influence in this piece. Now, Bach made that trip when he was 20 years old, and this piece that we just heard the clip from is an early piece by Bach, probably written in his mid-20s, so it seems like he was really inspired by this trip to Buxtehude. So what is a passacaglia? That's maybe a term that you might not be familiar with, even if you are familiar with something like chorale or prelude or fugue. A passacaglia is actually one of the simpler forms, and it's really a joy to listen to because of its repetition, but also because of its variation. It starts out really simply. You simply have one melody. You have eight measures or so of a simple melody played all by itself. And then the rest of the piece has that melody featured in the entire thing with just extra fluff above it or below it. So each variation is introducing something different. So first we hear the theme. Then the next thing we hear is the theme repeated, but other notes above it. Now what you just heard there was that same melody underneath some new material. That first melody was played on the organ pedals, so this would have been played with the feet. And then when you heard those next notes come in on the variation, those notes would have been played by the hands. There are 21 variations in this piece before the passacaglia ends. And if you listen to this whole thing, it's really a passacaglia and fugue. So once we get past 21 variations, we have a fugue. And it takes that same melody, and it does even more interesting things with it. I'm not really going to focus on the fugue today, although certainly in a future episode we should, because there's a lot of great stuff in there. And we'll talk more about fugues in future episodes too. Bach was really known for them, and really, I mean, pretty much unarguably the master of fugues of all time. <laughs> I think it's, it's not even that crazy to say that. But let's focus on the Passacaglia, of which Bach didn't write as many in his life. This is really the only organ one that we have that's cataloged, but it's a tremendous piece of work. It's really haunting, earth-shaking in a way, especially if you hear it on a really nice organ. So we have all these variations, and then each new variation introduces this new color and this new atmosphere. You can kind of think of it as like a group of people talking about a topic. And the topic is the main theme, the main melody. Everybody's got their own opinion on it. So each eight bars, each eight measures of music is another person in the circle of friends talking about this topic. And each one is weighing in on their own special way. You get to hear in the middle of this passacaglia a moment where the notes start to get really jumpy all over the place. And it sounds like you have the main melody in the bass again, in the pedals, 
and then the organist's right hand is just flying all over the keys and some faster notes. And then right after that, Bach turns that on its head. The next thing you hear is the melody, way up high now, being played in the right hand. And those flying notes are now being played with the left hand. And then Bach gives the organist's feet a little bit of a rest here for about eight bars. You also noticed in there that you heard when this organist played on the right hand there, he added a little bit of ornamentation to that melody, which we didn't hear before. Just a little trill. These kind of ornamentations would have been really standard. Some of them would have been written in the music, and others would have just been left up to the performer to decide to do. We talked a little bit about a couple episodes ago about how some of Baroque music is kind of like jazz in a way, then that you get to improvise a little bit of it. And this is no exception. You get to sort of decide when you want to put these ornamentations in. And now we're getting to my favorite moment. This particular variation has these floating down notes and da 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 kind of sounds. And here is what you first hear in the pedal. And this sort of da 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 thing is all over the place in these eight bars. And just like we said before, that's that one person's take on this idea in our analogy of this being a group of friends talking about something and then it's gone so you have a fleeting eight bars of this cute little idea being played underneath uh, this time Bach putting that melody up top and my favorite moment and I can't really explain why except that it's just a great moment that I love is the last little section of those eight bars when the bass has a little bit of an unexpected note and then, right after that, it just floats, 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 floats down to its lowest note. I really love that little line there. I mean, the piece is full of all these little lines that you could pick out any of them that you love. That happens to be my favorite. Another great thing that happens in this piece is pretty soon, he just breaks everything up into tiny notes. And we got rid of those long notes. So where did the melody go? It was made up of long notes, right? Well. It's basically just being played on the beat as a short note. Even though it sounds like a bunch of little notes being chopped up, the melody is in there and it's just happening on those beats, like right here. Really cleverly, he's hidden that in there, but even if you're not listening for those particular notes, the music totally sounds natural because it's following the same chord progression that we heard before. You can get the sense that every time that he does these eight bars, the chord progression is the same, and there's this inexorable lead in toward that low note coming. probably what makes this thing feel just so haunting and just captivating. After that we get a nice little fast, really flying finger section. And then we get these big pillars of sound just feeling like these big statues until it finally ends and then you get the fugue that comes in.
I really like this particular performance by the organist Reitza Smits. It's really well done and really well recorded. But any performance of this piece, especially if you hear it live, is special. I think the reason for that is that this piece is just, it just feels like what it is to play the organ. I mean, it feels like being in control of this huge machine. And because this melody keeps repeating every eight bars, but it's this big earth-shaking foundational melody, it really gives you that like flavor of being in control of this huge machine that is the organ. It's such a special thing. I mean, really a delightful but also a terrifying sound and experience really to play an organ. It's just like being part of the building that the organ is built in. It's, there's something special about that. The last thing I want to say about the Pasacaglia in C minor is that it's one of those pieces that's ubiquitous enough and popular enough to be transcribed for a lot of other instruments. Now, transcription just means that somebody took all these exact notes and put them on other instruments. Bach did some transcriptions of his own, of other people's music. There is a famous one by Leopold Stokowski for orchestra, uh, who was a famous conductor. You might know him from the Fantasia movie. And then, being a handbell conductor, I love the handbell version of this, which is very hard, just like the original version. And you can hear in this performance by Cathedral Bells, which is a group that I direct, some of the real technical trickery that happens in this piece. And I'll include a link to that performance in the description too. And to your point about the architecture thing, the organ is a really remarkable instrument in that respect, but also the pedals are what really make this whole piece, right? And not every organ of this time period in all parts of Europe had pedals, but in Germany, Bach was able to have access to these wonderful organs that had these pedals, and he learned from Bach Stehuda how to write these pasacalias and things like that. But I think the reason why this really works and why this is such a standard in in every organist's mind, so many organists play this, is that the piece itself is such a beautiful work of architecture. It has this very clear theme that happens by itself with no ornament. And then as it goes along, and this is what a Pasacalia can do, it builds upon itself and new things are introduced, new characters, like in your analogy, are introduced. But, but by the end of it, it, it all had to be masterfully designed by one person. And the organ is stuck inside a building and is part of the building. And this piece becomes part of the building when you play this piece. It's really it's like there's some sort of synergy going on there. Yeah, really nicely put. That's exactly what I meant when I said that it feels like when you're playing this and hearing it, it feels like you are the organ, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and... The topic of improvising ornaments and doing little improvisations onto a piece of Baroque music is, is really interesting. It's something we can unfold as we go along with the music of Bach. Sometimes we think of sheet music, like music that was notated in notation, as you have to play that, and that's exactly what you play. That's true of some modern music that's notated, but in the Baroque era, if you weren't ornamenting things, you weren't playing it right. And that's definitely true of solo keyboard music. So... It's really fun to get to know a piece like a famous one like this and then hear a few different performances and compare them and see what they did and how they ornamented. And, and we, we sometimes try to get into the head of the people that existed these 300 years ago to see how to think about how they would have played it. And now here is Alex's favorite moment from the Pasacalli in C minor. If this introduction to a musical moment has inspired you to hear the rest of this piece, please see the link in the episode description to see this performance by the Netherlands Bach Society. Do you want to hear our new episodes as we release them? Go to your podcast app and hit subscribe. Okay, Christian, what moment are we going to talk about next week? We're going to look at the C major prelude from the Wealth-Tempered Clavier Book 1. 
BWV846. Okay. Until next time, enjoy those moments. <laughs> <laughs>